continuing um, what we've been doing over the last few weeks, which is the story of Passover. And um, let's see if we can set this up using the Bible uh, as the basis of the fact that this is symbolism and allegory, etc. We have understood over the last several weeks the emergence of Moses as a part of our personality, the, the divine part of our personality, that will take us away from the conflicts of the mind that, you know, are very destructful to us in our home, the negativity, uh, uh, all of the anger and the violence that also manifests itself in the world in the form of wars and, and all the pillaging that we've grown up with and kind of have accepted. And so what we find is this Moses comes to life within us out of the water, which is the truth of our meditation, and then moves into the meditative state, going into the desert, and then comes around the backside of the desert, which is <coughs> the inference to this Kundalini, which is the movement up the seven chakras. So when he does that, he then elevates himself to the mountain, which is in symbolism the higher mind, and there he meets the burning bush, which is the spirit, or the fourth stage of consciousness, which is fire. He then receives instructions, and he is told to take that which is the rod, which is the symbol of the spine, in which the spinal fluid flows and the energy flows up the spine, and that when he throws it down, the rod becomes a serpent, and uh, meaning that when you no longer place dependence on yourself and your own ego, that then will become the spiritual power that will set you free. And then he is told that Aaron, who is his brother, will come within him and speak and so forth along with him, and they will confront Pharaoh. Okay? So what we're looking at is not the existence of these two people at all, but actually understanding that they both represent different parts of our nature. We have a Pharaoh nature which clings to that which is the old ways and clings to that which is uh, the, the, the material aspects of our life, but the difficulties and does not want to let us go, and we have that which is the new way which is uh, Moses. So these are, these, are, these, are, these are parts and parcel of the aspects of our life. And we've reached the point now where you've, you, you've learned, you've gone to your meditation, you've, the energy has started to move within you, and now you've got to confront that. Not you necessarily, but the energy within you will start to confront the mind. Because there's got to be an end to all of the violence. There's got to be an end to all of the, the stress. And there's got to be an end to all of the ne negativity and all of the things that we've struggled through in our lives, whether they affect children, whether they affect teenagers, the old people, or whatever. We've lived in a, in a, in a time, in an era, in an age of extreme violence and negativity. And now you come to the point where you're going to confront that within yourself because of the fact that if you do not free yourself, you can't free anybody else. If the negativity doesn't stop in here, the negativity will not stop in your house. It's impossible. And if the negativity does not stop in here, the negativity will not stop in a city or in a state or in a country. And where you have millions of people who are just inundated with negativity and, 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 and all of the violence and so forth that they've been cultured with, then you have it exploding into violence, whether the violence be in your house, whether the violence be in a country. It all comes out of the same thing. It comes out of the mind. And the story of Moses and the story of Passover is the story of not a person, not a country, not a, not a pharaoh, but a story of the very aspects of the human mind and freeing yourself up from those things which have held you in bondage and have caused you so much problems. So here you're going to get to the point of trying to become free. And so you have a confrontation. Basically, the confrontation is with yourself. It's on page 52. It's in Exodus chapter 7, on page 52, Exodus chapter 7. Okay, Exodus chapter 7 and verse 14 said, The Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. And you know what that means? Your heart is hardened. Your heart is hard. Even though you don't want it to be, it is. Because what you'll see, you'll see all these plagues come, and every time Pharaoh said, I'll let you go, but every time he changes his mind. And it's like us, oh God, get me out of this mess, and I promise I'll never. Do it, or I'll never, and then as soon as the mess is over, we go right on and forget about it until the next plague comes. And we get plagued, and we get plagues of health, we get plagues of money, we get plagues of family and domestic problems, we get plagues with children, and these plagues continue to come and continue to come, and we go to church and we pray that if we can only get out of this particular plague, we'll never, you know, we're going to stay, and it just is, why? Because Pharaoh refuses to let go. Your mind will not let you go. 
And here you, 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 know, you, you look outside and, and you see what has happened. You see the, the, the problems that we have in the schools. You see the problems that we have with children. And yet nobody, there's not a soul that is willing to sit down with a child or with a teenager and begin to explain to them the workings of their mind. Who is that? Oh, no, pray to some god somewhere or do something else or study this or study that, but never get to understand yourself. And so the person then becomes a teenager, becomes a young adult, becomes a mature adult, and never has an inkling of what goes on within themselves and why they feel the way they do, why they think the way they do. What's going on in here? Nobody is, nobody ever will sit down and discuss it with them. And so in Exodus chapter 7, verse 3, we see it was God that said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Because there are two aspects in you. There's a Pharaoh aspect and there's a Moses aspect. And every one of you has that. And I have it and all of us have that. We have that part of us that clings to the thing that I'll do it this way. I'll direct it this way. I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell myself what to do. And then there's this Moses part that's saying it hasn't worked. It's wrong. It has, it has, it has brought forth a violence and an evil. There's got to be a way that we've got to find the desert. We've got to find that emotional churning Red Sea. And we've got to cry cross it to a promised land because otherwise we're in a self-destruct mode. And our homes were in a self-destruct mode and our countries were in a self-destruct mode. And so then the admonition comes in Exodus chapter 7 where you are in verse 15. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. When are you going to confront yourself? At the point when you are enlightened. The morning always means when you're enlightened. You are never going to do a thing with yourself. You're never going to do a thing with your mind. You're never going to do a thing with your negativity if you're not enlightened. Never. It, it, you're no match for it. Doesn't make any difference how much you pray. Doesn't make any difference how many songs you sing. You, your kids, your family, where you work. It will never work unless you rise up in the morning. In other words, when the light starts to come upon that which has been the darkness, that's the only time you can go. And the only time you'll find that enlightenment is when you're in meditation. And so it says, go to Pharaoh in the morning. And that means deal with your ego in the morning. Deal with your ego when you reach a point of enlightenment. Deal with your ego when you know what the ego is. Deal with the ego when you know how and what it is capable of doing to you. Because for the most part, we spend all of our lives, we have no idea. Go to the Pharaoh in the morning, and where does it say you will go? Exodus 7, 15, and go out to the water which means to the point of truth, which is that second part, that second stage of consciousness. And what is it said that you will do? And you shall take that which is the rod. In other words, you will find that which is the energy which rises up the spine through those seven chakras. That's what you've got to do if you're going to confront Pharaoh. You can't do it any other way. You can't bring it. You can't read a Bible about it. You can't take any instructions about it. You can't go in and pray about it. You've got to do this. This is the only way. When you become enlightened, you energize that which is truth through your meditation, and then you depend on that which is the basis of the energy which flows up the spine, which the ancients called Kundalini, and which the Christians call the Book of Life and the Book of Revelation. And this is what Moses then, which is your higher mind, speaks out to the spiritual mind, which is Aaron. And he says in Exodus chapter 7, verse 19, he says, take your rod and stretch it out upon the waters of Egypt. In other words, take that, take that which is, which is yourself, take that which is your physical being, of which this divine energy will flow, and bring it into contact with that, which is the deception which comes from the left side through your meditation. And what happens when he does it? It says then the rod touches the water and it becomes blood. In other words, when that, when that energy of the self touches the distortion which has been in you and strangling you all your life, it becomes blood, it becomes spirit. The water turns to blood. It's the same as the water turning to wine. When you energize yourself with inside of yourself like this and something starts to change within you, that which has been the truth that you've always believed and you've seen it be distorted in front of you suddenly turns into that which is spirit. How did it happen? Because you took the rod, you took control of that which is the spinal area through your meditation and you allowed it to generate the energy and it touched that which you've always perceived as truth and it turned it into blood. It turned it into that which is spirit. And look what it says in Exodus 7, verse 21. The fish that were in the river died. All of the things that you believed as truth, all of the thoughts that you used to entertain, died. 
All of the things that used to scare you, all of the things that used to scare your children, all of those things which were part and parcel of what you thought was your culture, your society, all of that stuff died. And it says the river stunk. In other words, you couldn't even stand those things that you thought were so important before. You couldn't be drunk. You couldn't swallow. You're not able to swallow the old things that you used to take into yourself and say, oh, this is it, hallelujah. What a wretch am I in singing all of these songs and, and so forth. This is my religion. And now you find out, you look at that same religion which was so precious to you, and you say, what is the result of it? We have had situations recently where Joan in, in her travels around this town ran into people who used to come here, whose relatives would badmouth this place. And you see this here, this family is an absolutely total destruction, totally destroyed from one end to the other. And yet they just cling to this fact, get out of this place and go to our church and, and, and sing these songs, never understanding what is the true admonition of God and what is required from them to break down all of the barriers within themselves that would set them free and instead the children are destroyed, the elderly are destroyed, all parts of the family self-destruct. So what happens then? As you start to activate this, in other words, what's happening, what this is talking about, something has moved with inside of yourself to change the things that you used to depend on, to change the things that you used to feel were so important. And all of a sudden, there's a change that comes with inside of you, and you find that I can't even deal. I can't even look at these things anymore. These things which were set up as my traditional culture. And it says in Exodus chapter 7, verse 23, Pharaoh turned and went in his house. In other words, your ruling ego is still controlling, but your mind is wondering. It's not strong like it was before. It's not determined that this is the only way. What you are listening to and what you have listened to over the last several weeks is the most occult, most deep part uh, of the scriptures that you and I have ever come together with. And, and they're trying and they're yelling out to you from thousands of years, this is how this is done. This is why I am so concerned about some of the things that we find ourselves getting involved in, which we call New Age. And, and because basically when you look at them, they're just things to distract you away from this path, which is the one path, and that is the God path. There is a God within you. There is a truth within you. There is an energy within you. And when you follow these instructions from that which is God and energize this, then you're set free. All the rest of it just gets you your way in distraction. And look what it says in Exodus chapter 7, 25. And seven days were fulfilled after the Lord had hit the river. Seven days is a reference to the activity of those seven chakras, which has caused the lower mind to be less attractive. And you know what? If you don't understand, you can meditate until the cows come home. If you don't understand what's being said, it means nothing to you. It becomes irrelevant to you. What's he talking about? I don't know what the hell he's talking about. What's he talking about? And maybe even the things, those old things, still are not unattractive to you. But they won't become unattractive to you until you rise up in the enlightenment of that which is your meditation. You touch that second stage of consciousness, which is the truth of the existence of God within you. And then you place your dependency within yourself on the energy that flows up the spine and impacts the pineal gland and throws up the right side. When you do that, and what is required of that? It sounds so complex. You know what's required of you to do that? Stop. Stop, be still, and let it occur. And all of this will kick in automatically. It's just like when you become frightened. What happens? What do you have to do? You have to do nothing. What happens? All of a sudden, your body starts to kick in. And all of these things start to go, and you start to feel, you start to feel flushed. Yeah, I didn't do anything to feel flushed. Why am I feeling flushed? Because that's what happens. Your body reacts automatically. And when you come into this meditation, you don't have to say, I want to come rise up in the morning, touch the truth, touch the rod, and all this kind of stuff. It just happens. Yes, you want to stand up? At work, we have biofeedback. And if you don't believe this, they put this thing on your finger, and you're like level and you're fine. And all they do is say, OK, start at 123 and count backwards in, in increments of six. And you go, <laughs> stress is unbelievable. And it shows, I mean, it's amazing. It does it automatically. Yeah. It's all automatically, exactly. And that's what, that's what this book called the Bible has been trying to tell people for thousands of years. There is one way to make this work. 
Do it this way, it'll work. But we have conjured up so many gimmicks, whether they be religious fundamental gimmicks or new age gimmicks, that we've missed this completely, and we run to do this, and we run to do that, and we try to do this. And, we ha and, and, for, and most of us haven't any idea that this exists within this is existing. This exists within you. It's inside of you. The Passover is inside of you. The Pharaoh is inside of you. The Moses is inside of you. All of this stuff is inside of you. And it will come to life within you. All you have to do is be willing to discipline yourself to sit still and allow it to work. And so it says that the Pharaoh goes in the house, the seven days are fulfilled, meaning the energy of those seven chakras occur and the movement starts. But remember, you're doing all of this stuff. You've gone around to the back of the desert. You've meditated and still things are screwed up. Still things are no better than they were because Pharaoh won't let you go. Pharaoh won't let you go. And there's something that has to happen before Pharaoh is going to let you go. And that's why you meditate. People come and say, well, I meditated and, you know, the things don't seem to be any better. What happened last week? What did Moses say last week to God? You know, ever since I started talking to you, everything has gotten a hundred times worse than it was before. That's what Moses said to God. This is supposed to be good. This is for cock. Do you tell me this? The whole thing is going down the toilet. Where are you? I don't even know where you are. I can't even see you. You're telling me this stuff. And look how bad it is. And not only that, but once he was talking to God and God screwed everything up worse, then the people didn't blame God. Who'd they blame? Him. They blamed ever since I started coming here. This is going down the toilet. It's because of you. You and your wife with the blonde and everything. In the <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what it is. And so here's... So here was the first thing we had blood. The water was turned to blood, which means that the truth that you always believed as a Baptist, as a Methodist, as a Presbyterian, as a fundamentalist, as a, the water, that, the truth that you, all of a sudden is a mess, you can't believe it anymore. Doesn't make any sense anymore. The Spirit has changed something inside of you so you can't swallow that stuff anymore. The Spirit has changed something inside of you so all of the things that you used to depend on are not dependable anymore. And now here comes the next plague, plague number two, because here Pharaoh still hasn't let you go. Here are frogs. Frogs all over the place. Can you imagine? Frogs under the chair, frogs in your shoe, frogs in your pocket, frogs coming all over the place. We got, we got frog, frog. Look at this mess. Wall to wall frogs. Remember this is a myth. What do frogs do? They come out at night when it's dark and they croak. <laughs> 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 And they're all over the place. Every time you look, ribbit. <laughs> See? What is that? Is this going to drive you crazy? Huh? And you know what's happening inside it? You, you want it. You, oh, I'm going to study this. Oh, I'm going to read A Course in Miracles. And you're going to sit down and read A Course in Miracles. And you're going to be very holy. And you're going to learn spirit. And as you open the book, and you start reading it, this is The Course of Miracles. <laughs> what happened? That was a frog that just croaked. Where's the frog? In the book? I don't know. A frog is a thought. I can't even read this. Everything is croaking inside of myself. You know what I'm telling you? I can't do this. Oh, and I know what I'll do. I'll go to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. And you sit in the Wednesday night prayer meeting. And in the middle of the Wednesday night prayer meeting, <laughs> because I'm going nuts inside. Because it won't let you stay still until finally it drives you to that place where the Pharaoh inside of you will say, get out of here for Kakta already. I don't want any more of it because I can't stand it anymore. Because you know what? People do not come to this place until they get to the point where they are disgusted with everything they've seen out there and they don't want no more of it. As long as they're comfortable with the little brown church in the veil, that's where they'll stay. And they'll sing these songs that are written in 1492, and somebody will say, God is coming back, and they'll say, yes, I can't wait. And that's the end of it. Because it's not important. It's not until you reach that point of blood and guts, real life disaster, you say, I can't take any more of this. What, there's got to be a different way. And that's the frogs. And you know what happens? And in 8 7, Exodus 8 7, it says, The magicians also brought frogs. And what is that saying to you? It's saying that every Thing that comes from spirit, that comes from the truth of God, can be duplicated by religion. 
everything. But remember what happened when Aaron threw down the rod and it became a serpent, and the magician threw down a rod and became a serpent. What happened? Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod ate that which is the magician's. It will always devour it up. Once you place your dependency, and remember, throwing the rod and making it turn into a serpent is placing that dependency no longer on yourself, which is symbolized by the spine, by throwing it down in the meditation. And there's a promise to you. There's a promise to you. Here is where the God who wrote this Bible is saying, I'm promising you something. If you will throw down the dependency on yourself, then it will hit the floor. And once you hit the floor in that meditation, no longer dependent on your own mind, that will turn into the serpent, which is the kundalini, which is the female power of Almighty God. That's a promise to you. And you know what Buddha said? Try it. Don't knock it until you've tried it. And if you say it can't work, try it. And most people who say it doesn't work would never try it. So how do you know? So we go on. And so what they tell you to do, have faith. And what is your faith in? Your faith is in something that somebody else told you. And the person who told you has no idea whether they have truth or not. But they have faith in what they told you because somebody else told them. And the only place then you'll ever experience truth is when you enter within yourself. You have presided, and I have presided, and our relatives have presided, and our families have presided, and our grandparents have just presided over the utter destruction of the earth, the ecology, the children of the earth, the teenagers of the earth, the poor people of the earth, the women of the earth, the homosexuals of the earth. All of this absolute destruction we have brought down upon, and we've covered ourselves by hiding in churches with stained glass windows and singing, I'll walk in the garden alone. You will walk in the garden alone, because there ain't going to be no God hanging around with us. We absolutely destroyed everything that we put our hands to. And what have we accomplished? We've made bombs. We have atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs. We, can, we, have, we have all kinds of bombs with bugs in them, and they can come out and do all of these things. This is, a, this is what we do. And then we took around and say, look around. And in all the cities, and, all, and you've got all these outreach centers for drugs, and, and you see children destroyed because of why? Because we have refused to let that, which is the ego, we hung on to it. Pharaoh wouldn't let it go. There are ten plagues that get involved here. And they have an occult significance. And these plagues come into you to make your mind less and less attracted to the old crap that you have lived and made the foundation of your experience. It all becomes less and less attractive to you. And finally you reach the point of saying, I've got to move in a different direction. So how does your carnal mind see these things? You see it in the results of your own life. Take a look at your own life. How many plagues have you experienced in your life? How many plagues have you experienced? In? I've experienced them. How many plagues have you experienced? How many plagues have your children experienced? And for the most part, we've seen children experience plagues and look at them. What's the matter with you? Not realizing that what was happening was an impetus that was formulated by the power of that which is nature, which is God, to take you and me to realize this is not the way we should be. This is not the way life should be for kids. This is not the way life should be for elderly. This is not the way life should be. There's got to be a better way. This is the plagues that you and I experience. You want to call them frogs. You want to call them hail. You want to call it blood. You want to call it lice. It's all of the thoughts that have driven you and I into the corner sometimes screaming out for somebody to take us for us to drop dead or for whatever reason. How many plagues have you experienced? And for most people, you've experienced plague after plague after plague after plague, and who's the boss? Pharaoh. In fact, you've, re you've experienced so many plagues in your life that you've started to accept it as normal. It's the way things are. There's nothing you can do about it. That's the condition of the human psyche. It's the way it is. Nothing I can do about it. Nothing we can do about it. And that's in your house. So take the plagues outside. You got a drug plague. You got more drug outreach centers in this country than you have AMP. You got a rape plague. You got a brutalization of children plague. You got a brutalization of women plague. You got starvation. You got people that you look on television and see babies, black babies in Africa, shriveled up and they look like ghosts with flies crawling on your face, and you'll read the Bible about plagues. You got plagues right here. What do we do about it? Nothing. 
what can we do? It's what you've got to do is respond to the directions that you get when you go to the backside of the desert and climb up into the fire mountain and you receive instruction. That's what you do. And you know, it doesn't cost you a dime, and it doesn't make you join any church. You don't have to become a part of any congregation. You don't have to become a part of any group. And you start to find out what you do and how you do it. And then you start to set this world free. You start to set the children free. You start to set the teenagers and the animals and the ecology free because you've finally woken up and listened to the instructions that came from the mountain of fire and the backside of the desert. And when you recognize these things, and you finally, maybe you'll come here, and you'll finally say, I will submit to this desert, I will submit to this fire through this meditation, then Pharaoh will have to set you free. But something's going to have to happen. And next week, we'll really get to that point. Because you know what? All of our lives, we saw these things as normal. Do you know that? When I was a little kid, we used to march with the soldiers. This was wonderful. We were, this was the most exciting thing, to have a war. Huh? Let's have a war. This is, you know, everybody's ego gets, hey, so what? We're not there. It isn't real. Let's have a war. Let people get killed, and pe bombs are falling and burning people's houses down. It's a war. It's exciting. It's like sometimes people like to see light hurricanes come. Hurricanes can wipe things out, but it's exciting. Because we're so bored. So let's have a hurricane, let's have a war, let's have all of these things. See, these are all exciting to us, which is the way we look at things. The things that you saw you held as good in the past, you begin to see in a different light and they become frightening to you. Religion, nationalism, organizations, patriotism, traditions. You know what all of that stuff is? You know what religion is? You know what patriotism is? You know what traditions are? I'll tell you what they are. They're blood, they're frogs, they're lice, they're hail, they're everything evil to break down the spirit and subject you to whomever is trying to get control of you. Religion controls. That's why I don't want anybody in this place as long as I'm here that controls anybody. I don't want you to be controlled by me or anybody else. I want you to be absolutely 100% free to find that who is it that within you to take you wherever you're to go and to be free and to be subjected to no man, no woman, no group, no organization to be free. You come, you come. You don't come, you don't come. I cry, so what? I'll get over it. You have to be free. That's what's important. That's what's important. Bill? Yes? How long is this going to take? It took 2,000 years of malfunctioning Christianity. To How long did it take for the Soviet Union to go away? But it hasn't gone. It's completely gone. There's this, ta there's this nation called Russia. The Soviet Union is gone. How long did it take for South Africa suddenly in the spring twinkling of an eye to overthrow the regime of apartheid and for Mandela to become president. All right, but it's still... No, it's not still. It, 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 it will take less and less time as the energy of Aquarius builds stronger and stronger and stronger. The point is, who are those who will be trampled by it who don't understand what's going on? Yeah, that's guess what I'm asking. Yeah. That's not up to time. That's not up to nature. How long will it take for the snows to come when February gets here? It doesn't make any difference. It's predictable. Okay? But if you're going to go out in your bikini when February comes, that's your problem. It does, it's not the problem of nature. See? No, it's not, it's not a thing that's going to take a lot of time now because you're right in the middle of it. And as you get deeper into the cusp of this Aquarian thing, the changes will come more and more and more and quicker and quicker and quicker. But in Exodus chapter 11, that's where I want you to go. Exodus chapter 11 and verse 1, there's one more plague. And the Lord said to Moses, I'll bring one plague more, and then he'll let you go. And do you know what that plague is? First of all, look at Exodus 11 too. Let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and gold. In other words, that's the preparation. Let me tell you what silver is in metaphysics. Silver is mind. It is human. Gold is spirit. It is God. 
And what is saying, let every person begin to touch these things and have these things. Have that which is the mind renewed by that which is God. Have silver, have gold. Remember something, and I think the point that Carol was just making, this is not something that will change you at all if you don't want to be changed. This is not something that can do anything to anybody who does not open themselves to it. Okay, So you've got to take that which is silver and gold. And then it says in Exodus chapter 11, Verse 3, that the thoughts and the importance of that which is the divine mind is understood and revered now by the carnal side. Something is happening. The importance of the mystical right hemisphere is beginning to be understood. I hope that you understand it. And sometimes when I hear of all of this stuff, I think that the whole thing has been a complete waste of time. My waste of time, your waste of time, because in spite of all of the things that we're told about living and allowing that which comes from the right side to pour forth and touch the other person, sometimes we don't don't see it, see. And so we come now to this point in the existence of the ego, in this point to the existence of your being, which is called Passover. And you know what's happening right now, the question you ask? It's Passover. You know what Passover is? Passover is the Passover from the, spring, uh, from the winter to the spring. And you know what is the winter of the universe? Pisces. And you know what is the spring of the universe? Aquarius. And Passover is happening. Happens inside of you, happens in, inside of your home, and it happens in the universe. And then it says in Exodus chapter 11, verse 4, Moses says, The Lord says, Midnight, I will go into the midst of Egypt. Midnight, why midnight? Because 12 is perfection. Midnight, why midnight? Because on the zodiacal clock, midnight is Virgo, which means the virgin. Everything that you're going to do must be born of the virgin. And that means there must be not one stain of thought in your mind. I don't care who gives you that thought, flush it out. I don't care who tells you, flush it out. Whether it be a pope, whether it be a pauper, whether it be a friend, whether it be a relative, this will happen inside of you through virgin consciousness. It will not happen any other way. And all the rest of it is talk. All the rest of that which you become involved in now is a waste of time because at midnight, at that point of perfection in the virgin consciousness, that thing which we call God will go in the midst of the Egyptians. And you know who the Egyptians are? The thoughts that hold you in bondage. The things that scare you. The things that hurt you. The things that have hurt you and your family. These things are going to be touched. The beginning of virgin consciousness is where God is going to move. And the Passover, that movement from winter to spring of Pisces to Aquarius, is the movement of Passover from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere within you. And so many are going to miss it in the same way that they missed that Passover thousands of years ago. Why? Because they didn't understand it. Don't you see? My job here is to explain it. I can't explain it any simpler than I've explained it. And I have explained it. And if you have listened, you'll know what you have to do. And if you won't do it, the results in your life will be exactly the same as the results in the life that are written in this book. There's no quarter given. This is not fun and games. This is life or death. That's up to you. But it's so, so simple. You don't join anything. It don't cost you anything. You just respond to discipline within yourself. And that which is the lamb, that which is your desire to be, that which is your desire to have, that which is your ego, that lamb must be killed. And you take that which is the life force of your ego, the life force of your desire, you place it on the doorpost of your heart, which is the centerpiece of your mind, and the angel of death will pass over your house. And you know what you say? You either will or you won't. It is none of my business. It is none of anybody else's business. You either will or you won't. But I'll tell you, there is only one way to do it. And that way is through the mystical power that is waiting to explode within you. Because if you'll allow it to happen, that lamb will be killed by that which is the angel inside of you. That blood will spatter on the doorpost of your consciousness. And all of it will be done automatic. You won't have to do a thing. All you have to do is be still. That's all. But you know what? That is too much for most people. Go to a meeting. Sure. Be still. <laughs> it's too, too much. 
And I want to just, we'll wrap this up because next week we'll get into the, to the Passover of this thing. In Exodus chapter 11, where you are in verse 5, and it says, All the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits on his throne to the firstborn of the maid, maid servant, all the firstborn of the beast, the firstborn must die. Okay? Does that mean that God goes around killing babies? No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What does it mean? Real quick, go with me. Page 942. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, page 942. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look at verse 45. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Thus, the firstborn are the thoughts of the carnal mind, which is connected to the physical direction. After the firstborn, Jesus dies. Then the lastborn, Christ, lives. Real quick, go to page 963, Colossians 1.15. It says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? That which is the human psyche. What, did you hear what it said? Who is the image of the invisible God? You! You! Not church, not religion, not Bibles, not hymns. Not doctrines, not popes, not bishops, not priests, not ministers, not evangelists, not rabbis. Who is the image of the invisible God? You. That's why God's name is I Am. The hardest thing in the world. And if you tell people to say, who is God? I Am. They'll say, you're a cult. You're a nut. You're, you're of the devil. They can't deal with that. And that is what steers them off into the oblivion of religion not realizing that that which is the essence of the universal God of nature is me. And once I bring it to life, once I sacrifice the left side that is the lower me and elevate and bring to life the right side which is the higher me, then I will move out of Egypt. Then I will cross the wilderness of meditation. Then I will come to the churning Red Sea of my emotions. Then the Red Sea will part and then I will cross over into the Promised Land. It says in 11.5, the firstborn, the lower energy, must die. And it doesn't make any difference if it's Pharaoh which sits on the throne down to the firstborn of the beast. You know what it's just talking about there? It's talking about the duality of the seven chakras. That which is the chakra that sits up at the pineal gland and the door is tightly closed so that you can't activate it, must die. That which sits at the base of the spine down at the sacrum, which is the lusting, fleshly part of us, that must die. Until each one of those sevens are open from the top to the bottom, until each one of those sevens are open, the be no life, there'll be no love. All of those things must die so that you can live on a spiritual plan. These centers which are closed must be opened. So, and if this is not myth, if this is not spiritual, then God is a violent monster who thrilled in the slaughter of little children, which obviously we know is not true. And so then we come to that point, that point of the, of the movement from the left hemisphere of the brain to the right hemisphere of the brain. We come to that point of the understanding of what it is with inside of us that can come to life if we'll allow it. We come to that point of the energy, knowing that is the energy within us, will suddenly start to move, suddenly start to change, suddenly start to direct itself, and we will finally be free, and then we will know the solution to the problem, the problem of ourselves, the problem of our children, the problem of the country, the problem of war and violence. All of these answers lay across the other side of the Red Sea, and when we reach that point and the sea opens, we will go to the promised land, and the promised land will explode with the use of cells, of brain cells that we know nothing about, and will give us direction and instruction as to what we must do, where we must go, how we must answer, how we must behave, and all of these things will come empowered so that we will be set free, and we will set this world free, and the guns and the bombs and all of that stuff, which have been the, the hallmark of patriotism and glory and excitement, will be beaten into the ground and plowshares, and the grain will grow, and the children will no longer starve, and this planet Earth can be converted into the planet Heaven it was intended to be initially when it was first created. It was ruined and destroyed by people who refused to listen, and to this day they have created themselves 
Babel-type religions and still refuse to listen to the fact that you must, you must enter within yourself, take that rod, throw it down, touch the water, and then allow the plagues to chase you out of the control of Pharaoh across the desert of meditation, past the churning Red Sea of the emotions into the holiness of the promised land. That's what you got. And it all happens by your submitting to the meditation that is in your mind. And there are many people who will try to convince you and have convinced you totally that there are other ways. I am here to say there is no other way on the basis of Jesus, on the basis of Buddha, on the basis of Krishna, on the basis of Moses, on the basis of Muhammad. The kingdom of God is within you. You'll either use it or you won't. You'll either take part in the Passover or your house will be destroyed. It's that simple. But you have a choice. And you can't say it's too hard because all it requires of you is to shut up. And that is hard. <laughs> I should know. <laughs> Thanks. We'll see you. And uh, next week we'll...